You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Episode 5. In this episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Dan and I have a chat about what we take with us in our blind bags when we head to the field, and we're also going to be joined by the guys from Fouled Reality as they preview their upcoming Season 4 of their uh, online video series. All right, welcome to the show. This is Episode 5 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. Joining me as always is my co-host, Dan Harushka. Dan, how are you? Doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Uh, we've got a good show here uh, this week. We are going to be joined by the guys from Fouled Reality. They are uh, superstars on YouTube and Facebook, and uh, they're getting ready to start their season four of filming of their show. And uh, they're going to come on and talk with us about uh, what it takes to get you know a show to that level and uh, what they've got coming up for epi- or, uh, for their season four. So, uh, really excited to chat with them. And um, you know we're 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 pretty much in a in a lull in the in the hunting action for us here. Um, you know the the duck season comes back in for four days here uh, in Jan- in um, in uh, October. So uh, we get four days to kind of get after him. And then unfortunately here in Virginia we're 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 kind of sitting around until mid uh, November when the season comes back in. So probably take that time to uh, get out in the deer stand a little bit and and try to fill the freezer in that regard. But um, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a quiet period here in the duck hunting world for for me until we get into the big push of uh, November, December, and January. Yeah, it gives you a shot to check all your gear over and, you know, find a replacement for your now leaky waders. I know we talked about my leaky waders, but you can uh, try and find some deals on a new set. Yeah, I, uh, I developed a, a leak on the inside of my left knee here this weekend, which um, I was super thrilled to find. But like you said, it's better to find it now than uh, in December. So, um, yeah, I'll be doing some uh, waiter patching in that in that downtime for certain. But uh, <laughs> that's the worst. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a disappointing, disappointing experience. But, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, a lot of outdoor people, uh, struggle with, I think, and I know I struggle with is, um, you know, what do you take with you in the field when you're hunting? What do you pack? What do you leave at home? All of that kind of stuff. So I thought it might be a good exercise for us to talk a little bit about what we take into the field with us and, and share with everybody kind of how we pack for, for a a field or or a, a water hunt per se. Um, you know, and I'll go ahead and start here. Um, for those that know me, I, I'm, I'm self-diagnosed kind of OCD with some things. Um, I hate clutter. I hate disorganization. It just adds a level of anxiety to me that I just don't really like. So I try to be super organized and I hate carrying too much stuff than I have to. Waterfowl hunting um, in general makes it difficult because you're packing, you know, decoys and things like that. So you've got a lot of gear that you're carrying just in general. Um, so when it comes to my blind bag, I really try to keep it downscale and uh and organized so that when i need something i can go in there and find it pretty easily but uh where do you kind of stand on that dan um i'm more of the cluttered type i think you know i, I can I, con- think, yeah. I can confirm that you are the cluttered type i've been in your truck it's, I mean, it's cluttered <laughs> you yeah you say it's like a gym locker but you know what i i still i'd say my number one thing is license license stamps but you know if we're going out of state just making sure that I'm legal to be where I need to be. Usually, if if it's a worst case scenario, everything else will be covered by one of your buddies. But being legal is is the thing I'm most paranoid about, no matter where I'm at. So I make sure that my license is you know up to date. I have everything that I need, and that's my number one in my blind bag. Yeah, that that's really you know shouldn't be overlooked. Depending on the state you hunt in. You know, for me, I carry my license a lot in my wallet, so I've always got that with me. But, um, yeah, keep being legal, and that is certainly a number one for me. Um, you know, another thing that I always carry in my blind bag is plenty of ammo. Um, something that I always, always carry and I see overlooked by a lot of people is ear protection. Um, I do my very, very best to wear ear protection whenever I possibly can in the field. I tend to bring extras with me in case guys want to, want to use it if they, or if they forgot theirs. Um, you know, but we've all had our, our ears rung by somebody, you know, that's shooting next to us in the blind, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, when you spend a lot of days in the waterfowl blind, you know, you can do some serious damage to your hearing. So I really try to keep some ear protection with me whenever I, whenever I can. 
Yeah, I, I learned that one from you. I actually have a couple pairs in my bag now just because, uh, you know, following tips from you and cutting wood all the time. I used to never wear ear protection, but you can start hearing a constant ring and you know that something's not right. So, you know, take care of your hearing. That's, you know, you can't get it back when it's gone. I just, I, I'll just go on from here. My number, my number two would probably be toilet paper. I know it's kind of gross, but... I enjoy a cup of coffee, sometimes two cups of coffee before we go out to a cold duck blind. And, you know, like everyone else, I'm human, uh, but I don't like to to use clothes or a hat. So toilet paper is probably my number two here. Let me let me say something right now. As gross as that may be, <laughs> if you're not taking toilet paper with you in the field, you're just asking for a situation. I mean, it's just that it's just that simple. And I mean, I've had to bail guys out plenty of times because they didn't have it. So you will not catch me dead in the field, deer hunting, uh, any kind of hunting. It doesn't matter. You will not catch me in the field without toilet paper. That's just a fact. Yep. I'm in, I'm in the same boat there. You know, another thing that that is important, um, you know, that I carry is I carry a lot of different, uh, I, I carry multiple sets of gloves because, uh, you know, obviously when you're calling for me, I, I don't like to wear gloves when I'm running a goose call and that kind of stuff. So, um, but I, I do bring a, a set of gloves that I can have easy on, easy off so that when, you know, I'm just sitting there in a downtime, my hands aren't freezing or I use a muff, you know, type of thing. Um, but also, you know, you bring your waiter gloves so that your, uh, your decoy gloves rather. So you're pulling decoys out of the cold water and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I always have both of those in there because I don't want to forget either of those, you know, in a, in a rush trying to get out of the house. So I make sure I always got two pairs of those in uh, in my bag every time. Yeah. Uh, the, the decoy gloves are a must when it starts getting cold. Um, just something else that I always bring it are either some band-aids or athletic tape. Um, usually the duct tape's too big. I usually have that in like a archery bag, but, um, yeah, athletic tape, if I have my dog out there and, you know, sometimes when we're in cut corn, you know, you get slivers and start bleeding and, and need something. So um, athletic tape and a knife, that's usually something else. I'm, I'm sure that most hunters have that, but uh, you never know. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of these things are, are, are obviously just staples that everybody should have. But a couple of the things that I always try to keep with me is, um, you know, face paint, you know, something to cover up with in that regard. I also uh, always bring extra Ziploc baggies. Um, you know, I usually have my phone in a Ziploc bag or a waterproof pocket in my in my bla- in my bag, that kind of stuff. And um, also, what I've been doing is bringing a uh, you know a plastic grocery bag, a Walmart bag, or something like that in the field with me because I've been hunting a lot of uh, you know military res- uh, installations and things like that where the blinds have to be left impeccable when you when you're done hunting. So all of your shell casings, all of that stuff, has to be collected up. And, and took out of the field with you. So, uh, you know, I make sure to bring a bag like that so I can collect all that stuff up, tie it up tight, throw it in the boat, um, and, you know, disregard it whenever I get back to the shore and throw it away. So, um, I always make sure that I'm prepared to clean up after myself when I'm in the field. That's a good one. We said it before, you know, leave it better than you found it. You know, if, if a landowner is letting you go out and hunt fields or if, you know, if it's your own field, you don't want to leave stuff there. So, you know, make sure you get all your casings and, I guarantee if a landowner goes out after you've been hunting and you go back for permission the following year or later in the season to talk to them, they're going to have a couple words for you if they're, you know, if they're going to bale a field and, and feed that to their cows or whatever they might do with it. So, you know, that's just, you know, common courtesy. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's only really two more things that I can think of that are just absolute must have for me in the, uh, in the field. Um, the one is my coffee thermos. It's, um, it's small enough to fit just inside of my blind. So I have it with me all the time and it's just enough for three cups of coffee. So, um, I bring that with me every single time without fail. And, um, I'm drawing a blind. Oh, my, my, my last one was, um, I bring a smoke bottle. Um, I don't know what it's really called. Um, but you know, a wind indicator, things that you use when you're deer hunting typically. I brought that to, with me, uh, in the, into the field now because it's just easier for me to hit that once or twice, see which way is the wind blowing. Is it changing? That sort of stuff. Um, just so that I can make sure that my blind and my decoys are set appropriately. So, uh, you know, I've always had them from, from being a deer hunter. So I've just adapted those into the field as a, as a waterfowl hunter too. I'd have to I'd have to pin you as a major snack or two. You always have a granola bar or something of that sort where I usually get jealous of it come about 10, 1030 in the morning. But uh, yeah, you're always prepared with that, too. This past weekend, I had two granola bars, a banana and an apple all in my blind bag. 
now that can change the menu the menu changes from time to time but yes i i i bring i make sure i'm nourished when i'm in the field that's just overboard <laughs> So th- there's a couple other things that, you know, I bring with me on occasion that I don't bring every single time. One might be a GPS, depending on where I'm hunting, if I need that to find, help me find where I'm going in the dark. Um, another thing that I will bring with me from time to time is a rangefinder. We hunt some spots that are kind of suburbia, if if that makes any sense. So um, we have to make sure we're, we're, we're you know, uh, far enough away to be legal from hunting from some homes or, uh, you know, if we hunt certain parts of the state, we have to be 500 yards from a, a legally licensed blind, things of the, that nature. So um, in those events, I'll bring my range finder with me just to make sure that, you know, that we're legal and we're hunting where we're allowed to. Yeah, you don't want to be within the safety zone. There's, you know, that could that could cause problems as well as, you know, the we didn't talk about bug spray. You know, you always have your your thermocell and I've been I've been going out with the deep woods so uh the deep woods bug sprays has kept the mosquitoes off me this year and that's something i greatly appreciate yep yep it's it's very important um anything else you think that you know might be worthwhile or uh you know that something might somebody that might want to take with them in the field you can think of yeah headlamps especially this past weekend setting up and about half the guys didn't have one and you know walking around in the dark headlamps um calls if you are the caller of the group just make sure you know you have make sure you're prepared that's all yeah i can't believe i forgot headlamps i actually carry two with me for that exact reason either i'm always deathly afraid that i'm going to be out caught in the dark with mine and it and the batteries die uh or, you know, if someone forgets one and I need them to help me, you know, set up and stuff, I, I will use that. Of course, calls too as well is a, a really great point. So if there's something else that you think is important that needs to be in the field with you, um, you know, I know some guys would probably talk a little bit about, you know, uh, preparations for your dog. If you've got your dog when you're in the field with you, bandages for the dog, food, water, that sort of stuff. Um, but if you have anything else that you think would be beneficial, um, you know, to share with the show, we would encourage you to uh, send it over to us in an email info at hpoutdoors.com or hit us on Facebook or Twitter and, and uh, continue the conversation there. And again, you can always call us on our hotline at 724-609-3695 and uh, share your, uh, your tip with us. And if we like it and we think it's a good tip, we will play it on the air here and share it with the rest of the, uh, the rest of the listeners of the podcast. So, um, you know, Dan, when we, when we talk about interviewing people for this show and who we want to have on on and, and who we think would be great guests um almost immediately uh the boys from fouled reality came to mind for me and i say that because um you know as someone who consumes a lot of online media videos that sort of thing um you know i've seen so much of their work uh, they are all over youtube and facebook i mean their numbers as far as their followers and their subscribers and things are just staggering so um i was really excited when we got to talk to those guys and uh just have them you know pull the curtain back for us a little bit and just see what all goes into that because they they without a doubt put out some of the best uh you know waterfowl related content that you can find on the internet right now yeah they definitely have a great thing going and you know they're putting some major miles on and you know they put a time a ton of time into these hunts and it's just not the the pulling of the trigger but all the b-roll that they take and it's just you know it makes you feel like you're out in a field with them or you know just sitting right next to them shooting a bird so i mean they just do an excellent job and i'm ready to throw a couple questions their way yeah i agree so uh let's go ahead and get into it and we're going to be joined on the show by the boys from uh, fouled reality All right, we are joined on the show uh, today by the gentlemen from Fouled Reality, Blake Hegemeyer, Ryan Breesh, and Chris Walters. Guys, how are you? Good, great. How are you? We're doing well. Hey, we're uh, we're really excited to have you guys on the show. Um, you guys have a really unique uh, thing that you've got going on, and we're really excited to talk to you about it and, and find out some more information. But um, for those of of them, of them that are listening to this podcast and haven't heard of you guys, uh, tell us a little bit about what you guys have going on and how you got started. Uh, this coming year, it'll be our fourth season. And uh, way back in the day, Chris and I, um, I'm Blake, we kind of developed the idea, came up with the name, and it, it kind of stems from a growing number of online, you know, hunting videos that were popping up everywhere. I had a lot of the video equipment from filming deer and turkey from past years. I filmed for a film the outdoor channel. 
our first move when we kind of came up and formulated the idea was to contact a company to try to get them involved in any way possible. You know, we really didn't have a product to show them, just an idea to pitch them. My first phone call was to the owner of a Michigan-based online waterfowl gear company, and that happened to be Ryan. And through small talk that night on the phone, you know, Ryan said he was driving past the arch in St. Louis. And I said, really? You know, that's like 20 minutes from my house. And uh, as luck would have it, Ryan, he was from Michigan, but he was currently working at a power plant that was about 35, 40 minutes from where Chris and I live. So we ended up going to his house numerous times that summer, and uh, our relationship kind of grew from there, and Ryan bought into the idea, and, you know, long story short, here we are today, four years later. Ryan, Chris, and I are, you know, the, the three partners that uh, are kind of spearheading about reality. You know, I want to share with some of our listeners just how successful you guys have been. Um, I checked the stats this afternoon. Uh, currently, at that time, you had over 13,000 likes on Facebook, over 7,000 YouTube subscribers, and over 4,400 Twitter followers. And I couldn't help but notice you have at least one particular video uh, that had over 170,000 views on YouTube. I mean, that is just incredible success. Um, I applaud you guys for that for that level. And when you got started, did you ever think that it could be as popular as it is? <clears throat> Obviously, we had hoped it would, um, but to be honest, we never dreamt that it would grow as fast as it did. Um, I mean, we wanted to produce something different from a lot of the hunting videos that were out there, um, which is probably a correlation to our success. Uh, we're not afraid to show hunts that go bad, and we don't solely focus on feeding birds. Um and so far, it's worked out great, and it should continue to grow as we increase the production behind that reality. It's awesome. A lot of people now are making videos. Tell us a little bit about how you guys separate yourselves from the rest of the pack. <clears throat> well, we try to focus on more of what goes into it rather than just the hunt of it itself. Uh, you'll see in a lot of our videos that they're not always successful. Um, we always try to make sure that there's something to learn. Um, you know, we've always said we combine uh, education and entertainment. So um, that's what we try to do. Uh, we look at what other people are doing and just try to think outside the box all the time. And I think that that's definitely helped separate yourselves. Um, have you guys, have you ever considered taking your show onto uh, TV, you know, the outdoor channel or, or something of that sort? And I think anybody who hunts, you know, anybody that watches outdoor programming and starts making videos themselves has that dream of one day, you know, seeing themselves on the television. We're not really any different than that, but there's a huge financial commitment that goes into purchasing airtime on outdoor programming, you know, TV stations. Will we get there? Hopefully. Um, right now, we're just focusing on increasing our production value and continuing to expand upon our fan base. Hopefully, by doing this, you know, eventually someday we're going to make that jump to TV. Um, last year, we actually provided a few segments for a program on uh, SportsCenter Channel. But hopefully, you know, someday that show is going to be our own, and we'll be the ones producing those 13 unique videos for Outdoor TV. Yeah, I mean, you guys definitely have the, uh, you know, a solid foundation in, uh, you know, uh, a lot there's a lot of people that try to get on on tv these days and you know quite frankly some of the shows just aren't quite that engaging and um you know i can only speak for myself but i find you know when i'm sitting at my desk you know working from home typing reports whatever i'm doing i'll throw on some fouled reality and it's just playing as a you know and i'll go i'll you know mow through a season or two just as i'm working throughout the day so you know you guys have definitely kept me engaged and you know dan and i have, have done a little bit of filming on our own nothing to the level that you've done but you know we, we've tried to put together some things and just you know, the editing and, and the financial commitment, that's one thing, but you don't really have a show unless you have content. You know, it's, it's, it's not just harvesting birds, but you're obviously, you know, you need to be on birds and that kind of thing. So talk about the effort that goes into getting yourself into position to have the kind of content that you want. You know, how many days are you spending in the field every year trying to get this done? Uh, last year, I think we spent uh, right around 53 days filming in the field. Uh, obviously, 
there were a few days when our cameraman needed a fix and we kind of put the camera down for a while, uh, let him get, you know, fix that, uh, itchy trigger finger he might get instead of shooting him with the camera all day. Um, so there's probably a couple more days in there, but he, we gave him the opportunity to shoot, shoot some actual birds for once. <laughs> um, you heck of a guy, nice guy there, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, obviously those days are few and far between not not very many people actually Blake is the only one that really knows how to operate all the uh, the equipment Ryan and I are in the process of learning it um, in hopes that we can you know get some uh, more cameras in the field or give Blake some more bra- uh, Blake some more breaks and allow him to shoot some more birds over the course of September and March we traveled over 10,000 miles to make foul reality season three happen. So there's a lot of time on the road, a lot of time in the truck, a lot of days in the field. And what it really boils down to is we have very, very, very amazing wives. <laughs> um, Absolutely. We, can't, we cannot thank them enough for allowing us to pursue this dream and do what we do and, and you know make all this happen. They are the wheels that make foul reality turn. <laughs> Absolutely. Last year, uh, there were numerous times where you know, we get the phone call that we're going to go on a hunt, um, sometimes within hours before we actually go. And um, you call the house, hey, I'm going to be home at 5 o'clock after work. Uh, I'm going to be out of the house at 6, heading to Kansas or something like that. And when we pull in, uh, when I pull in, there's a, a bin sitting there with food and coffee and snacks, and she knows what all these guys like to eat and make sure that's backed up and how many days are you going. And uh jumped online and got your license for you. Uh, got a few things together and have a good time. We'll see you in three or four days. Uh, go do your job. So uh, they're absolutely amazing women that we have that uh, allow us to do that. We might want to make sure that we don't count that out. I was, I was gonna one say- other, too, that I cannot forget having two small children is my mother. Mimi saves me a lot. <laughs> on those days where you get a phone call and you got to be gone in a few hours, luckily she only lives an hour away and is retired and from the month of September through February, she's kind of on call. Um, she does an amazing job, and along with our wives, this could not happen without my mom to babysit my children. You know, it's fu- it's funny that you say that. I'm sitting here writing things down, you know, 53 days, 10,000 miles. And I was like, man, the thank yous for the wives better be coming soon. <laughs> so you guys are right on cue with that. <laughs> I don't, I don't think there's. I don't care. Yeah, I don't think there's a. You well, know, I'm newly uh, married, so I'm not used to saying that. <laughs> well, you better get used to it, but I promise you that there's not a there's not a there's not a water. She's, she's been a she's she's been a heck of a sport so far, and she doesn't complain. Maybe she likes the house empty without me. I don't know, but. <laughs> Yeah, she's been a good sport about it so far, and I can't thank her enough. Well, I promise you, I know you guys spend a lot more time in the field than, you know, probably the average guy, but there's not a waterfowl hunter out there that's married and has kids and that kind of thing that doesn't know a thank you, you know, to their wives and their support staffs at home for the amount of, uh, you know, time that we all spend, you know, your weekends and that kind of thing. So uh, we can all relate to that. But, Absolutely. You know, you guys are obviously on the, you know, the extreme end of that, you know, compared to the normal guy. Um, you know, for example, the, the normal guy might go – one out of state hunt a year, you know, maybe him and his buddies book an annual trip somewhere or something to that nature. You know, talk about some of the different states you guys are visiting, you know, year in and year out to make this make this show happen. Well, since the beginning, it's it seems to increase every year the number of states that we go to. Uh, last year, we were in seven different states, um, starting up in North Dakota, down Michigan, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma. Uh, Missouri and Illinois are obviously in there, uh, being close to home. This year we've got 10 states planned in three different flyways and one province up in Canada. Um, Alberta, we start off in October. Um, New York, we're going to do in September. Then we do our North Dakota trip in November. And from there on, it's just seeing what happens with the weather and what happens with the the waterfall and how that's how the season's going to progress to see where we move to next. Uh, we'd like to hunt all 50 states in, a, in, in an entire season, but obviously that's not going to happen. But we we definitely are on the move and um, and and keep it alive for sure. Yeah, 10,000 miles. That's that's quite a bit on a vehicle to to get around different places to hunt. Some of the states you just named are just you know awesome for wa- waterfowl hunting. What uh, tell us what your favorite place to hunt? What's your favorite state? In the travels, 
that we that I have done so far, I would have to go with Nebraska. Um, there's a huge variety of environments to hunt in. There's a ton of off the grid locations that you know here in Illinois. If I was to see that location, I wouldn't think you know that's not worth hunting. In Nebraska, those little off the wall spots, a lot of them are awesome. You know, you've got marshes, rivers, lakes, ponds. Obviously, the dry fields when it gets cold. It's not a state that you hear a whole lot about for waterfowl, but we've met some really awesome people from Nebraska, and they've given us some invites, and we've had some knockout hunts. You know, we were from ducks to snow geese. We were there in early December for the first really harsh cold front, and uh, we finished our season there in uh, the snow geese migration in the spring. It's an awesome state, and uh, looking forward to getting back to it again this year. Yeah, and you guys definitely pile up the snows and the greenheads. What what would you say your favorite species is to hunt? And on and on that note, uh, to film. As a group, I think uh, it's an overwhelming majority would say that the favorite thing to do would be hunt dry field mallards. Um, typically, when they're using the fields, it's cold. You know, they're driven by hunger, and they're usually fairly easy to pattern. Um, they tend to fly in bigger groups. They're easier to spot. Uh, it's, you know, permission permitting, you can. It's it's easier to get on the X, and it's just you're able to get into those knockout, unforgettable hunts. Um, I mean, when the ducks are hungry like that, they're usually a little less smart, and they've got food on the brain, and that's about it. And they got to stay warm, get a lot of energy in, and uh, you know, prepare for the harsh days of winter. And from a filming standpoint, having thousands of dollars of equipment over a dry field is way better than having all that stuff <laughs> floating over a pond or a marsh or any sort of water. So from a cameraman's perspective, I want to be in a dry field as much as I can. And as far as species is concerned, I mean, obviously mallards would be, uh, those big greenheads would be the number one species, but I guarantee you that if you've got a flock of, 10,000 ducks working you, and they decide that they're going to commit all at once, and right there front and center is a big old sprig pintail, and six guns come up out of that blind. <laughs> I guarantee you that favorite species just turned tail. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have footage of that from this past year. <laughs> you know, you guys you guys are touching on something that I wanted to get into next with you. Um, you know, you've got a lot of footage out there, and, you know, I've watched a good bit of it, and I certainly have my personal favorites of the videos that you guys have done. You know, the the episode where you guys shoot the hundred snows in a day is, is great. Um, you've had some, you know, really good, uh, mallard hunts. And, you know, I've also enjoyed some of the episodes where you guys have struggled a little bit and you kind of talk people through that. And one particular that I really enjoy is, uh, when you guys were up trying to film diver ducks and, you know, you were experiencing just how difficult it is to make a quality video, you know, sitting in a, uh, you know, a layout boat and that kind of stuff. But I'm curious as to what you, you guys have as far as your favorite hunts and, you know, maybe a past episode or a video that you guys look back and laugh. And maybe it's because you had a great hunt or maybe it was because you had some unique challenges that you kind of dealt with or, you know, just talk to us a little bit about some of your favorite memories from, you know, being, you know, recording the show. Well, I can tell you that, um, we could film, 300 episodes, and probably my favorite is going to be North Dakota in season two. And the reason being, um, for the first time, it was a chance that I got to get my brother out that I don't see very often um, to do something like that with us. Uh, he's a diehard waterfall hunter, but uh, it was it was awesome to get him involved and let him see what we like to do and also get him out on a hunt like that. It was also a turning point, I think, for us as called reality to do North Dakota because um, that turned out really well as an episode, and I think it it struck a chord with all of us that, um, you know, there was a really good chance that we had some potential potential to compete uh, in the industry with filming and that we, ha- we have some good guys, and with a little bit of work, we could do good. So I think that, that North Dakota trip in Season 2 was, was the best uh uh, in my mind, just for those reasons. I would have to say I'd go back to Nebraska with mine. Um, last season we had an episode called The Arctic Cold Front, and it kind of goes back to that off-the-grid place. Uh, it was a, a river, I mean, it was what it was called, but it was not wide at all, you know, maybe 12, 15 yards, um, more of a creek than anything. The temperature 
you know, plummeted probably 50 degrees in 24 hours. We went from white jackets and long sleeve shirts to three layers of clothing that following morning. And by the time we left, there was ice chunks flowing in the river. And we didn't see a ton of ducks. We didn't see a ton of geese. But what we saw, man, you didn't have to really do anything. They saw that little bit of open water there in front of you and a couple of decoys, and they were coming. Oh, that was That's probably my most memorable experience just because of the setting. It was gorgeous. It was snowing the first day. You know, you've got the sand hills of Nebraska, um, pine trees, this big bank embankment of a river where the blind just disappears, and uh, it was gorgeous. Beautiful setting. Yeah. Um, in season two and three, you may have noticed we did back to back trips to Oklahoma, um, and that was established by way of an, uh, a relationship we developed through social media. Um, with a guy named Josh Dickerson, and he's he's become a real good friend of ours, and he uh, he tends to invite us out there just at the right time every year. Um, for, I mean, the uh, the opportunities out there. I mean, it's just, it's another one of those states you don't hear very much about. Uh, it's a diamond in the rough. Um, if you notice the episodes from Oklahoma uh, in season two and three, we had episodes from what we call the ditch. And it's just this, I don't know, probably, what, 10, 12-foot wide ditch that's five, six foot deep. And there's just, you you basically take captain's chairs, put them in the ditch, and cover yourself up with, you know, the random grasses and pigweed out there. Uh, And the ducks just get right off the river, and they they work by the groups of hundreds. Um, But my favorite hunt from last year, and probably ever, would be the episode titled A Step Behind from Oklahoma. Um, the weather played a bunch of tricks on us, and we had a bunch of rain and ducks just scattered all over Oklahoma where we were. And we had a, I mean, we put a lot of a window time in that, that weekend trying to find these birds after this rain came in. And we found a bunch of bir- birds flying and, and hopping to these fields, uh, but we couldn't really tell the landscape that we were going to be, be hunting if we were able to hunt it. We knew that there was probably going to be a little bit of water back there and probably, you know, just in the fields with the amount of rain that we had gotten, as well as and probably potentially a pond. Uh, well, we get permission and we get out there and it's, it's the perfect setup as far as we're right between these three ponds. Uh, we're hunting sea water with our backs against a fence row. And what I remember most about that hunt is, uh, the way the sun would shine off the green heads. It was, uh, it was perfect. It, it made for gorgeous videography and it, it was great. It was a great hunt. Uh, killed a, I believe a five minute limit out that day. And I mean, it was just one of those long drawn out hunts that you were able to have a good time all day and make the most of it. You know, that's something that you guys do really well in your videos is, um, you know, you paint a picture well, whether it's a struggle or a great day or you're spending time in the truck, you know, you, you paint that really well for the viewer. And, um, you know, it really helps us kind of, you know, as I'm even, even now this summer, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm watching you guys out there on the road and I'm like, man, I can relate to that. You know, I know how that feels. And it's, it's, it's just really cool how you guys are able to pull that all together. And that sort of leads me to my next question for y'all is, uh, you know, pull the curtain a little bit back for us. I mean, we, we've been talking about, you know, 10,000 miles, 53 days a year, you know, seven states last year, all that stuff. Tell us about once the videos, it, you, it's in the can now. Um, you know, you're in the off season or, you know, you've, you've talked about Blake running the camera most of the time. You know, how, how's the production flow work once you guys get all that footage? You know, how do you decipher it? How do you, you know, make those cuts that, that, you know, end up as what we see as viewers, you know, that engaging footage, you know, tell us about that process and just how much time. Cause I don't think people really truly appreciate how much footage you can catch, you know, capture in 53 days, you know, and how much you have to go through and how much time it takes to cipher that down to, you know, 12, 13, 14 minutes of engaging video. So tell us a little bit about that for you guys. You know, 53 days sounds like a lot of hunting, but when you go to sit down to produce 10 episodes, you feel like you need to have filmed twice as many. <laughs> it doesn't always work out the way you want it to. Um, what does work well is we're not trying to edit while we're hunting. Um, the typical foul reality season starts in March, which is right after, you know, the waterfowl season. For me to be able to produce 10 shows 
while filming 53, 60 days a year, I don't think I'd be able to live. Um, there's so much time that goes into producing one of these episodes. From an editing standpoint, once I have all the footage on the computer, for me to start to the point where I'm finished, I've got 8 to 10 to 12 minutes on my timeline. It's probably 15 to 20 hours, give or take. Uh, you know, it depends on some of our episodes. There's going to be a compilation of three or four or five days of hunting. Those obviously take longer because I've got more footage to sift through compared to the days where, you know, like the hunt Chris just talked about. That was one day in one episode. That's a little shorter. Uh, there's not as much stuff to sift through. I've got to convert footage. I've got to log footage, you know, so I know whenever I go to edit, what is this minute and a half clip have in it? Uh, so that's my first step is going through and naming all of them. You know, name it something unique so that I know if I look at that, I know exactly what's in there. Um, and then as far as, you know, cut, it, what makes the cut and what doesn't, you just try to weave in the story with the hunt itself and throw in an interview here and there that that tells what's going on. And nine times out of ten, when I start and go to finish and I come back and, and watch it, it all, you know, flows pretty seamlessly. Um, and then, you know, I'll have these other two guys watch it and kind of, you know, let's, let's try to do this, fix this, add that, take that out. And uh, the final product, knock on wood, has always, you know, kind of come out to where it's, it's worked well. You know, the three of us coming from different backgrounds, living in two different states, we work very well together. We all share the same passion and, uh, everything works out well. But yes, it does take a lot of time to produce one single episode. I was going to say, there's no doubt that you guys have passion, you know, for the, for the sport and getting out there. And just the dedication is, is quite amazing to, you know, put all your talent together and, and put together your episodes. How about, let's talk about just, you know, there's, we're in some of the harshest weather as waterfowlers, you know, you, you're spending hours and hours editing and, and putting these together. What would you guys consider the hardest part of making a video or making an episode? I think without a doubt, uh, it's filming them. Um, I've been fortunate enough to film anything from, you know, turkeys to deer to elk, but waterfowl by far and away are the hardest ones to film. You know, with a deer and a turkey, it's more, you know, it's typically one, two, three, four, five of them at the most. You know, they're typically walking pretty slowly. You've got a hunter or two of them that are right there within arm's reach, so communication isn't a big deal. In waterfowl, there might be a hundred, two, three, four hundred. You don't necessarily know exactly where they're going to fly, when they're going to turn. You have to really learn how to read them. There's times when you might have six or seven hunters that well, they might be 10, 15 yards in front of you. So the communication is a huge issue. Um, everybody's got to be on the same page. Not only between the cameraman and the hunter, you also have so many you know, pieces to the puzzle in a waterfowl hunt. You've got dogs that are going through a tree. You've got decoys out there trying to attract the birds. You've got guys calling. You've got guys calling the shots. There's a lot of moving pieces to waterfowl hunt, and in order to capture it all, it is a huge, huge challenge. Way more than capturing a deer hunt or a turkey hunt. You know, without a doubt, filming waterfowl is by far and away the hardest species to uh, to film, and that's the hardest obstacle we have to cross to produce these episodes. Well, I think without a doubt, you guys have a pretty good system figured out there. So, you know, you guys are doing awesome with that. Um, something that might sound a little bit funny, but when I'm watching a video or, you know, even on the outdoor channel, some of the, some of the shows I turn off immediately, but there's some that just totally bring me in. And one of the reasons, one thing I always say, I'm like, if I can actually have a sense of smell in their video, like if I can, if I know I'm in a swamp with them, or if I know that I'm in a cornfield with them, um, I totally get engaged with that. And I'm I'm going to ask you for a couple tips for what you guys do for other people that want to film hunts and just make, you know, make a better film than what the average Joe makes out there. I have a lot of patience and a lot of coffee. Um, 
for sure. But the the biggest thing, like Blake was saying, is you need to have a group of guys that work seamlessly together. Um, everybody has to be on the same page, and there's no way we could ever stress that enough that that's got to be one of the biggest uh, tips that we could ever offer on filming waterfall. Everybody has to be on the same page. If you've got a camera guy that's back 15, 20 yards behind you and he can't hear exactly what the guys are saying in the blinds and somebody's going to call the shot and you've got birds scattered all the way across the frame of the camera, you need to know where that's going to happen. You need to make sure that you've got a guy that's calling the shot. Where are we going to call the shot? Um, go through two or three volleys of birds, see what happens. If you need to change something up, somebody else needs to call the shot. Uh, because they're coming in in a different area, communication is the you know another big thing. Communication, all being on the same page, and realizing that so much more goes into filming a hunt than just the hunt itself. We probably do just as much time in the field doing B-roll footage for these shows as we do actually doing the hunt. And then once you put in the interviews with the guys and stuff like that, there's a lot more that goes into that than just the hunt. So you have to be prepared to spend time. If you've got a four-hour hunt, there's probably another two to three hours that goes on after the hunt, filming different things, um, you know, getting the close-ups of your decoy spread. Uh, you always want to make sure you've got, you know, guys brushing the blinds, how you're getting prepared. Um, you know, there's just so much more that goes into it than just the hunt itself. A lot of guys think, well, you know, we're going to hunt for three hours tomorrow morning. We're going to go out and film for three hours, and then uh, we'll go ahead and put it on film for 15 minutes, and there's our hunt. We're good to go. But that's not the way it goes. Um, there's so much more that goes into it. And, yeah, just being on the same page, communication, having some good guys that uh, are willing to work together and a lot of patience. There, there's two ideas you can go into a hunt with um, if you're going to film. You can film a hunt or you can hunt on film, and there's a huge difference. If you're just going to film a hunt, you're going to push record, and what happens, happens. If you're going to hunt on film, you know, numero uno that day is getting footage and getting good footage, and that's the mentality that all of our guys have. We're not there to shoot birds. We're there to get good footage, and if we shoot 10 birds that are that are right on film, that's way better than shooting... 30 birds that are so so on film. Um, so there's a definite sacrifice to be made if you're going to start filming hunts and you need to make that decision. I was I was going to ask, do you guys have like a checklist going into a hunt that you try and get certain shots or do you talk about like guys make sure that, you know, we have this angle for, you know, I want to put this in a video. Do you do you guys, you know, get together before and and talk about what you're trying to do? We talk about that 365 days a year. <laughs> we kind of look at it as homework, you know, coming up with a shot list. You know, if, if you're sitting around the couch and have nothing to do, come up with an idea. You know, watch a show on Outdoor Channel, Sportsman Channel. Hey, I like that. You know, let's see if we can do this. You know, but how can we make it better? How can we change it up a little bit? Kind of go with the same basis, but improve upon it. So yeah, that's something that never leaves our mind. Um, like Ryan said, 365 days, we're always thinking about how can we do this? How can we capture that? How can we improve upon what we've done and what we've seen? And I, I think that right there is, is a great tip on, you know, not filming the hunt and just, you know, having a plan going into it. I think that's a great tip for a lot of people. You see a lot of uh, film with, you know, just one camera angle or, you know, just not a lot of content in, in different positions. So, to any listeners out there, that's that's a great tip. And a, a big obstacle in that too is the financial commitment. Um, you know, any, anybody that's going to get into filming hunts—I shouldn't say anybody. Most people that are going to get into filming hunts, you know, you start off with what you can afford, and we've done it too uh, over the course of four years. Really, myself over the course of ten years, I've amassed, as my wife would say, way too big of a collection of camera gear. But uh, you've got to start somewhere. You can't shoot for the moon from the start due to financial constraints. And uh, for anybody out there starting off, you know, do the best with what you can afford and, and improve from there, grow from there, 
uh, every year, you know, we try to buy another piece or two or five of equipment so that we can improve our production. You know, and it's funny because uh, you, you say that and that, that truly rings home because, you know, Dan and I both kind of dabble in photography and it's, you know, it's different, but it's similar in a lot of ways that you start with what you can afford. And so many times, you know, I found myself able to get better shots and things because I stopped relying on the abilities of my camera and I started thinking creatively, well, how can I, you know, get this to look good with what I've got? You know, how can I play the, you know, the cards that I'm yep. dealt and, uh, and, and use what I have in front of me right now to, to make this the best that I can. So absolutely a great tip. You know, everybody out there, you know, regardless of what their budget is, they can do something. And it's about what you can do with that something versus just trying to have the best and, you know, all of this kind of thing. Because at the end of the day, like you said, if you don't have the creativity, you don't have everybody on the same page and you're not all, you know, pulling in the same direction and, you know, putting the footage first, you know, it's not going to be a great product, but, um, so good stuff there, guys. Uh, I wanted to touch on something here because you mentioned this earlier and in our last episode, we had uh, Mark Brendamill on, on the show, who's a territory manager with Avery and a freelance outdoor photographer. And we talked with him about, you know, damaging equipment in the field. And, you know, he's talking about dropping, um, you know, Canon Mark threes into the swamp and all of that kind of stuff, which, you know, mm -hmm. anybody that's familiar with photography equipment knows that that is not a, that's not a cheap uh, mistake there. So why don't you guys share with us, uh, you know, if you have um, any issues where you've ever, uh, maybe damage a, a pricey piece of equipment in the field? Well, knock on wood, and I'm going to cross my fingers as I say this, no, we have not. Um, nothing major. You know, minor, you know, uh, LCD screen arms, um, lens hoods, GoPro mounts, you know, stuff like that. They get brittle when it's cold. Uh, we've had some, some breaks there. But as far as large equipment, expensive equipment, Again, knock on wood. No, <laughs> hopefully you don't say that way. <laughs> well, as we've long... been very fortunate. With, you know, as waterfowl hunters, with the conditions that we put our equipment through, we've been very fortunate, and everything is warranted. You know, there's warranties on everything, um, but you can never be too safe. And we've been lucky. Warranties on the warranties. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just want to make insurance on the warranties. Yeah, I want to make it clear for the record right now that if something, heaven forbid, were to happen to any equipment this year, it is not my fault for asking you guys the question and making you address that. So, just clarify that right. You know, you're gonna be the, this conversation is going to be the first thing we think of if that ever does happen. <laughs> I'm just glad I didn't have that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, you know, obviously, um, it takes a lot to make what you guys do. You know, the, the clips that we see online. You know, there's a lot that goes into that. Describe for us sort of generally what a normal camera setup for you guys is like when you're in the field. Uh, you know, the different types of cameras you're using, you know, how that all plays into effect, all that kind of stuff. I mean, while we're filming the actual hunt, uh, we, we typically have one main big video camera. Uh, and then we, we tend to sprinkle three to five GoPros throughout the, you know, the decoy spread, somewhere around the blinds, uh, maybe on one of the guns. Or on you know a, a head strap. This year we're probably going to be using about the same amount of stationary cameras, uh, but we're looking to add you know a second full-time camera guy uh, where or when he's needed. Um, obviously, you know the the more footage we have come editing time, uh, the better the final results will turn out. Uh, just you know the better the the final product will be. Yeah, without a doubt. Like you said, the more the more footage you have, the more the more you can use. Go into more specific. What what is the main camera that you guys you know? What's your go to camera? Well, the main camera that we use uh, that Blake typically films with is a Sony AX two thousand. Um, this year, we just added um, the Canon XA twenty that we're going to use uh, right up front in the blinds. Uh, just like we were saying, to add a lot more footage. Um, give a lot more uh, material for us to work with. And once the season's done, we start putting these episodes together. The more footage we can get, uh, the easier it's going to be to put that together, especially on Blake. Um, the more material we can give him, the, the more creative uh, he can get with that. Uh, we also added the uh, quadcopter this year for aerial shots, uh, which should give us a couple cool angles. Yeah, that was supposed to be a surprise, and you just ruined it. Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and to add on to that, a lot of the, the close-in stuff, the B-roll footage, the interviews and all that, 
most of that stuff comes from SLRs. Um, we've got T3Is and T5Is that, you know, we've got, uh, I guess, depending on who's hunting with us, we'll have four or five of them in the field with us at all times. So anybody and everybody that wants to push record, you know, capture something and, and every, like we've said, everybody works very well together and everybody has a creative eye and the more footage that we can get, the more memory cards that I've got to dump at the end of the day, the better off we're going to be come, you know, final finished product time. Yeah, without a doubt. Let's go back to the, the GoPros, you know, they're, they're super popular. Um, how much do you guys use them? I think you said you had about five that you scatter about. How much pressure do you put on a GoPro to get good quality footage? You know, in, in the right lighting, those things can be awesome. Um, in cloudy, you know, early in the day, late in the day, their footage leaves a little bit to be desired. Uh, like I said earlier, there's so many aspects that go into a waterfowl hunt. Uh, there, you either have six cameramen <laughs> that are capturing all of that, or you have, you know, a remote camera that's stationary. And from a cameraman's perspective, to be able to control them from afar is, huge and, and that's what we do you know we might have a gopro on a gun or a head strap or a decoy or a mojo or behind the blinds or in front of the blinds and whenever it comes time there's a flock in the distance and they're coming for me to be able to turn on the big camera push record and push record on the remote to control all those other cameras is is huge that way the guys that are hunting the guys that have guns they have one thing to to focus on and that's calling those ducks in, calling those geese in, and, and shooting them in the right spot. And I'm the one, or whoever the cameraman is, they're the ones that need to, you know, focus on capturing it with all the cameras going. Um, so we use GoPros a lot. Um, in the finished product, we don't use it probably as much as we could. Um, there's a ton of GoPro footage that nobody other than us ever sees. You know, you put them out there to try to get that that you know maybe not once in a lifetime shot but that once in a season you know video clip of a bird landing right in front of it or a bird you know getting shot right in front of it um by having four or five of those out there during the hunt you're going to increase your odds in, in hopefully capturing a clip like that and so that's why we use so many of them and uh rather than having to fake or recreate the guys coming up, you know, calling the shot and jumping up out of the blinds to pull the trigger by having those stationary cameras and those GoPros planted out there in the spread and around the blinds. We don't have to to recreate that. We can, you know, piece everything in when we're editing. It's all in real time. Um, there's nothing fake. Yeah, and the GoPros have been really sort of a game changer, I guess, for lack of a better term. And, you know, it's really allowed just sort of the normal guy to, you know, get out there and purchase one and, you know, throw the strap on his head or, you know, stick it in the ground in front of his blind and, you know, at least, you know, get some kind of footage that you can look back and kind of, you know, enjoy the hunts on, on your own sort of video. So those are obviously increasingly popular. And, uh, you know, I always, I always enjoy seeing, you know, good GoPro footage. Cause like you said, you know, they struggle at times in low light and things, but there is some really cool stuff that, you know, you, you see people that they're yep. able to catch you with them. So they, they definitely have their place. But, um, so, you know, we've covered a bunch with you guys and, um, you know, we were obviously, you know, fans of the show and, and all that stuff. So tell us a little bit about what's next for you guys and, and give us a little preview for season four. You mentioned, uh, you know, 10 states. Obviously, you got a big year plan. Tell us about it. Uh, well, this past season, the past off season has been extremely busy. Um, like we touched earlier, we talk almost on a daily basis, um, coming up with new ideas, new shots, um, new things we want to do, new things we want to try. Uh, it's you know, we're always pushing ourselves to take wild reality to the next level. So hopefully this year with all the stuff that we've talked about and we've just put a ton of planning and traveling um, into this coming year, it's going to it's gonna pan out. We're also really fortunate to have a lot of returning sponsors from the year. Lynch Mob Calls, Hardcore Decoys, Heavy Shot, and Wiley X are returning this year along with Muddy Dog Outdoors. And we're really excited that we're going to be doing a lot of work with uh, Beretta and Realtree this year along with Princeton Tech. Um, we're going to be doing 10 episodes for Realtree that's going to air on Realtree.com. Um, we don't have a name for it exactly yet. Um, we're coming up with that currently, but it's going to be five episodes solely dedicated to Realtree uh, that we're going to be working on. And then also in between those, 
is going to be uh, five videos that's going to be some real good tips for guys that are getting out in the field this year. Uh, it's going to start in mid-October and run through waterfowl season for 10 weeks. Um, and then our season will start in the first part of March. But it's going to be a really busy year uh, in editing and putting it all together, so we're real excited to uh, get out there this, this coming month, actually, and start. Wow, I mean, that's that's just really impressive what you guys have going on. Um, obviously, uh, you know, I've, I've said this already, and I'll, I'll say it again. I'm a big fan. I really enjoy you guys, your your stuff, and I'm looking forward to seeing you know, everything that you guys are going to bring out this season. Um, before we came on here today, I, I went online, and I, I, I was browsing just to see where all you guys are at, and I, I literally... Uh, I don't even know if I can count where all I you know people can find your content. So for for all of our listeners out there, why don't you guys uh, share with us where people can find your videos and your content online? The main outlets would be our website, which is foulreality dot com. Um, that's where we post all our videos, all our product reviews, uh, migration updates, you know, all of that type of stuff. Obviously, you can find us on social media like you touched on earlier um, we're on instagram facebook twitter uh, we also have a youtube channel which all of our videos get uploaded to um, and then embedded on our website so you can check out child reality on youtube uh, like ryan talked about the new videos that we'll be producing for realtree they will be on realtree.tv um, they'll also be uploaded to the realtree youtube channel outside of that uh our stuff is in a lot of places. So what we really focused on when we started this venture was trying to get it out to the map. Um, but those are the main outlets. The stuff that you can find elsewhere is are, are the same videos. There's nothing exclusive anywhere else. So check us out on saladreality.com on our YouTube channel. And then starting in mid-October, Realtree.tv and the Realtree YouTube channel. That's where our videos will be. And uh, we'll have new content starting in mid-October all the way through uh, I guess it would probably be, you know, mid May. Uh, a lot of, a lot of hunting to do, a lot of producing to do, and, uh, we're very excited and we're really looking forward to it. And follow us on Facebook to see where we're going to be. There's a lot of, uh, different waterfall and trade shows we do throughout the year, um, both during the season and in the off season, uh, different events and stuff like that. So come on out, keep us, uh, in touch on Facebook and come out and meet some of these guys and, and talk with us at these shows. You know, I, I I even saw that you guys have a Pinterest account out there. So, um, literally, there's yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's not just for the ladies. <laughs> there, there is literally no shortage of uh, fouled reality material out there. So, uh, you know, a simple Google search of your guys' uh, name will will unlock a lot of that for for you guys out there listening to this show. So, um, Blake, Ryan, Chris, uh, we appreciate you guys giving us some time here and coming on the show. Congratulations on all your success. Best of luck this year, and we look forward to seeing what you guys bring out here in Season 4 of Fouled Reality. Yeah, thank you for having us on, guys. Well, Dan, you know, when you watch a show like they have and the amount of content that they put out, you know that there's a lot of time and a lot of uh, energy and resources that are put into it. Um I just not sure that I actually could have ever expected that it was as much as what they just said. I mean, the time that they put in is truly astounding. No, and I, you can you can tell by the many thanks and kudos to their to their wives, especially being newly married and and putting so many miles on truck tires. I mean, they they put a lot of time out in the field and and they couldn't thank their wives enough, which I don't blame them. You know, they're they're out there and. Uh, I've said it before, a happy wife, happy life. So, you know, these guys have a great thing going. They put out just awesome videos, and I'm excited to see what, what this next season is going to bring. Yeah, there's no doubt that they they have just incredible support staffs around them to be able to do what they do. So, uh, uh, you know, again, they've had a ton of success, and it sounds like it's just getting better for them. So we look forward to seeing uh, Season 4 with the guys from Foul Reality. And, again, we encourage you all to go out and check them online. Uh YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, they're on literally every platform. You can go to their website as well. And, uh, you know, we encourage you guys to support the, the guys at Fouled Reality. So, um, let's go ahead and get into the parting shot. The parting shot for this episode has to do with something that's incredibly uh, frequent and common that I find online when I'm checking these forums. And, you know, a lot of people post messages about, you know, what kind of duck is this that I shot? 
And, um, you know, when we're talking about duck identification, it's something that's actually really important and should be uh, focused on a lot more. You know, recently I've been reading about a lot of the early teal seasons of that have been introduced around the country and uh, several states have actually passed up on the opportunities to have these early teal seasons for fear of misidentification of the bird and people you know, over harvesting unintended species and that kind of thing so it's really unfortunate because it just cuts back on the opportunities that that hunters have uh, to get out in the field and spend more time in the waterfowl blind so you know really i would encourage you to just take the time to to really try to to learn uh different uh, species and their flight patterns and their their feather patterns and things of that nature that will better help you identify birds in the field make no mistake about it they fly early in the morning a lot of them look very similar so it, it can be a challenging thing to take on but i assure you that it'll be more rewarding when you can pick out those species as they fly across the uh across the horizon versus uh, when you get home and you post it on a message form asking for help. So uh, give that a thought. That's going to do it for episode five of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl podcast. We'd like to thank uh, the guys from Fowled Reality for joining the show. Again, we encourage you to check out all of their stuff online. We hope you enjoyed our little chat about what we take in our blind bags. And uh, again, if you have anything to add to that discussion, feel free to reach out and uh, send it our way. You can reach us on Facebook and Twitter at our website at hpoutdoors.com and uh, at our at our. Um, our uh, hotline as well 724-609-3695 so uh for dan i'm josh thanks for joining us take care